in that in that in that the success of the band felt like gentrification or well, <laughs> well, just yeah um, well the the band became successful in 2000 99 2000 the gentrification really started like 93 it was the year I moved there anyway um, <laughs> my guilt started seven years earlier um, I was I'm never going to say that I was a poor starving person I always felt fairly comfortable, and I felt guilty about it from the second I got to the East Village. Luckily, Giuliani was much more of an evil person than me, and he was, you know, bulldozing down the East Village, and I was able to be righteously indignant about that. But I've, I've always felt like I was part of the gentrification, along with every other, uh, I don't know, person like me. And and then and then uh, and then Six and Love Songs was sort of coinciding actually with me moving. Brooklyn. <laughs> so it doesn't for me it doesn't actually parallel, but I see what you're I see what you're asking. It's a little hard to answer it. Um, it was really bizarre to become successful with this band, if that's if that's a helpful but parallel question. It was bizarre. You know, I mean I started this in eighty embarrassing eighty I don't know, early, early eighties, you know, so it took if anybody here is in a band it you know, it took seventeen years or something. Like that. You know, hard labor. So, it, and it really 69 Love Songs, a lot of it was in Stephen's studio apartment in the East Village. So, it was very, very tidy and not very gentrified at all. That's I a mean, really good point, yeah. There was, it wasn't the, the Chelsea apartment that they show later in the film. It was really, the room was smaller than the stage. It was the stage, yeah. And it was crammed with keyboards. There was literally a path that you had to walk to get from the bathroom to the bed and the rest was just all equipment and it wasn't very gentrified. <laughs> and that was actually a wonderful era for the East Village. So in a way our making six and songs did feel very old school in that way. Um, also I don't know how many people know this, but the entire budget in the soup to nuts was ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for a three album, three hour long record. So <clears throat> it, it was really you know, it was a real work of whatever. No, no, but yes, Peter. Uh, could you elaborate on the approvals? Did uh, Stephen or you have approval of the film? We yes, yeah, Stephen and I. Um, well, all of all of the key members got to see rough cuts, um, and then signed their release forms. So there was an understanding that they could continue to polish the movie after the rough cut but not change things so dramatically that something might be inserted, like a whole scene. Um, Krithi and Gail didn't want to have some latitude. Like they, they said, look, we want to be able to do some movement with this, but we, but we understand that you need a general sense of how it's going. I got really involved. I, I basically made her recut the entire first half of the movie after I saw the rough cut, because there was no backstory. It just began with the, with the now, which from a documentarian perspective was the right idea. You know why all these talking heads and all this backstory. But I thought that's not fair to this band to start with 2004 when we go way back. So we <laughs> gathered a lot of archival footage, we gathered a lot of talking heads of people talking about the past, and, um, and we reworked it really heavily. And then I backed out, and then they did a lot more work for another year to kind of polish it up. And it, it, was, it was very natural, it felt, it felt pretty natural. Like we kind of got it so that it made general sense, and then we walked off and let them really, you know, do what they wanted to do with it. Uh, yeah, I know Stephen has hearing challenges that make live performance difficult for him, and I'm wondering if you could comment on the kind of individual and collective motivation for touring moving forward. Um, does, does it, did everybody hear that? <laughs> it was about Stephen's hearing disorder. <clears throat> um, and, and what is our motivation for touring, given that he is in pain? for a lot of the times that we perform. Um, I, I feel a certain amount of guilt about this. I, I really push him into touring. I think it's good for relations, uh, fan relation, you know, knowing your people. Um, I also find it financially very helpful to tour. Um, so I, I really push him. He chops, you know, he's like, oh, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, and we fight. And basically we come to a, an understanding that, you know, it's been a real, really long and arduous process, but we, we figured out what the capacity, the edge capacity is that he can handle. We figured out 1,500 is his 
you know, after that, things start getting uh, too difficult in terms of having to up the sound in the, in the room, which has made my life very sad because we keep getting asked to play at, you know, Carnegie Hall and Beacon Theater and places in, you know, Hollywood Bowl and you can't do it. Um, so, so it's about money, it's about, you know, marketing, fan relations, all that, and then on his side, it's about not, you know, screaming in pain. So we, we've, uh, for anybody who's into the technical side of things, we have absolutely no stage monitors, which is pretty uh, weird. Um, Stephen literally sings blind. He doesn't, he doesn't have any monitoring of any kind. He just stands there in a strange echo chamber, I guess. We all have, uh, the rest of us, we put monitors in our ears. So the stage is actually like a chamber music. It's just acoustic, fully acoustic on stage. And uh, that's what he's listening to. So, but unfortunately, the echo of the house speakers, if, if you get above 1,500 capacity, it just becomes so loud that you, you can't do it. I don't know if that was helpful. <laughs> I just had a, a quick question. The first time I ever heard about the magnetic fields, I saw a poster for Get Lost, where it said something like 10, 10 or 11 songs from the uh, worst year of my life. See, there's a great example of sincerity. <laughs> yeah, like the poster for his 1995 album was, I think it was 13 songs from the worst year of my life. Um, Stephen felt really ambivalent about that album, actually. I think it's an amazing album. But as you probably, if you know the early records, if you notice that he, it's the least thematic. You know, the other one's really <coughs> sort of like he knew exactly where he was going with the theme. And I think that really bothered him at the time. Now it doesn't. Um, it's Correct me if I'm wrong, was that the first record that he actually wrote in New York? Really good question. I think it is. Yeah, I think it was. And getting lost, I mean, I think that he managed to make a theme out of getting lost, which, which worked, you know. The, the fact that he had moved to a new place and things were chaotic. <clears throat> I can't remember why it was the worst year of his life, but I know there were 13 blizzards or something in one month in the, in the yeah, February, he, said he wasn't not, eating. <laughs> yeah, there was the having no money and starving to death. Um, yeah, he was ill. But things were bad, and um, and he was angry at the at the record for a little while. So I think that was showing up in the poster. Now we all like it. It just went away. Whatever was going on, it's over. Thank God for time. Are we have time for a two, maybe three more. What's going on in your life now? <laughs> oh, I have a baby. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have produced something. <laughs> um, and she was born in late August, and that is entirely, entirely, and entirely what is going on in my life right now. Um, Stephen is in LA, really enjoying his paternity leave. Uh, he, he loves the fact that I don't have the time or the energy to call him anymore. Um, Every time I talk to him, he's positively laughing with delight. Um, he's having such a good time. Like, what are you doing? I'm going to the movies. Uh, he's going to the movies a lot and um, not doing any work. So I sent up a text message today saying I was becoming alarmed at how long, how long we had been not doing any work. Um, so we're going to try to get back on the stick soon. Sorry, I want to say that we're doing something really good. We're working on a new Future Bible Heroes record. Uh, yes, Chris do. and me and uh, Stephen have an uh, electro pop band, and uh, Chris will now tell us a little bit about it because I know nothing. <laughs> it's in very formative stages, and we're writing it in different ways than we have in the past, which involved the mail. I noticed in, in the film when you were getting piano bits in the mail, and you were like, this is such a unique way of, of working. Well, Stephen and I have done that for years now, where I would just send him tracks and he would write lyrics over them. And now we're actually collaborating on stuff where he's sending me lyrics and ideas and approaches to things. And then I'm kind of trying to put them together and then send them back to him. And then I think he's going to collage things and chop them up and take ideas and we're just going to play with them and make something that I don't think either of us have done before. So it'll be fun. Yeah, and I'm excited about this because in the last two LPs, the future Bible heroes have made, <clears throat> Chris pretty much makes the entire music and Stephen makes the entire lyrics and melody and it felt kind of like parallel play. So this is gonna be more of a, I think more of an enmeshed and integrated record, I hope.
and I, I believe, last I heard, that both Stephen and Claudia are going to be singing on it, like the, the very first one. So it should be fun. All right, well, everybody give a big hand. Thank you.